Let me welcome you to tonight's Mini Law Session. It's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience. If this is your first time here, we just um, reassure you that the coffee and cookies will stay for the duration, so please make sure to get yourself something to eat and drink if you haven't yet. Um, this is a series that, that we've taken on the law school for the last couple of years with the object of having some of the people who are connected to the law school talk about interesting current legal issues for a broad audience. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you in our building. I hope that if this is your first time, you'll find time to come to one of the next uh, next topics in the series. Tonight, um, I'm delighted to introduce Jamie Baxter to you. He um, is a wide-ranging thinker. He does all kinds of things from property law to land use, thinking about land use, to thinking about municipal law, to thinking about access to justice, to law and economics. Um, he teaches property law here to our first year students, and one of the things that I enjoy the most about him is he strikes me as someone, every time we get in a conversation, who's just interested in everything, has an idea about everything, and is incredibly actively engaged in all manner of um, topics here at the law school, and has sort of enriched the intellectual life and diversity of the intellectual life here at our faculty, so I'm sure you will enjoy him. Without more, I'll turn it to Jamie. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming out uh, this evening. Uh, tonight's lecture topic is going to be on, uh, as the title reads, Catastrophe and the Law, uh, Community Recovery After a Disaster. Uh, so we're going to talk about how communities recover uh, over the long term after the aftermath of a major natural or uh, human-induced or technological disaster, such as a, a flood or a hurricane or an explosion or an industrial accident. Uh, and we'll examine some aspects of how the law shapes people's decisions and choices, uh, both individually and collectively as they rebuild. Um, so I want to start tonight uh, with the aftermath of a very familiar disaster that struck uh, this city almost a century ago uh, in December of 1917, okay, when a French munition ship uh, loaded with nearly 3,000 pounds of explosive powder uh, collided with a Norwegian relief vessel uh, here in the Halifax Harbor. Uh, and causing an, uh, an explosion and an ensuing fire that flattened most of the city and uh, uh, especially impacted neighborhoods in the north end, uh, killing and severely injuring thousands and destroying uh, many, many buildings uh, and rendering uh, more than, I think, about 10,000 people homeless. Uh, so the, the Halifax explosion is well known in the city, but it's also, a, I think, a quite a unique, uh, quite a unique moment in the history of Canadian uh, disaster recovery uh, uh, it's remarkable for its, its response uh, uh, by residents and by governments at all levels uh, and to the challenge of rebuilding and, and reshaping damaged neighborhoods. So I say remarkable not because uh, I mean to imply that it was a particularly successful reconstruction effort. Maybe it was, uh, but it clearly had its problems and its shortcomings. Um, but I think that what it does is it captures the, the sort of contested values and conflicting uh, impulses that take hold of people uh, and communities in the aftermath of a disaster. Uh, and uh, I think ultimately it's these sort of contested values that really shape uh, how the law responds to disaster uh, uh, in these circumstances. So uh, I wanted to start uh, with this picture, which is a picture of Halifax uh, around 1879. Uh, so here we're looking uh, west across the peninsula, uh, and uh, you might notice that the sort of the main feature of this picture is that uh, it sort of trails off here uh, past North Street. Uh, uh, this, this line here uh, represents North Street, and there's not much. Uh, the picture itself cuts off, uh, and it looks like it's getting pretty sparsely populated out uh, beyond that. Uh, and indeed, at this time, uh, the north end, what we now think of the north end of Halifax, uh, is very much on the urban periphery. And indeed, throughout much of the 1800s, uh, this was farmland uh, settled by uh, mostly immigrants of, I think, German origin. So uh, if you jump ahead to the early, that's a, a closer up. If you jump ahead to the early 1900s, uh, uh, here a picture of the northeast end of the peninsula and uh, what's now become a populated uh, working class area uh, during a period of, of moderately rapid industrialization. Uh, the North End now hosts uh, important city features like the Halifax Sugar Refinery, which you can see in the distance there, the Nova Scotia Cotton Company, uh, as well as a, a prison and an infectious disease hospital. Further north of this still uh, is Africaville, a small African Nova Scotian community of about 400 at the time of the explosion. Um, uh, uh, not visible in this picture, but uh, farther to the north uh, uh, of this neighborhood. 
Uh, so with economic change at the time, uh, in North End comes some pretty substantial social ills, uh, and particularly for, uh, uh, for poor uh, uh, residents, uh, low-income residents, in the form of poor housing. Uh, and I, uh, I'll just note this uh, excerpt from uh, Hugh McLennan's uh, uh, famous novel on the Halifax disaster of Barometer Rising. And so he describes the North End, uh, a North End where houses look like Cracker Jack boxes standing in rows on a shelf and whose interior uh, made him shudder with plastered walls, sticks of furniture that look like rubbish, everything greasy, hand-touched, and sour smells issuing into the streets. So it doesn't sound like, uh, in some aspects of this neighborhood, uh, very nice surroundings. So in part because of its location, in part because of maybe some of the poor housing construction, uh, uh, this neighborhood, uh, at the time called the Richmond neighborhood north of Russell Street, is all but destroyed in the Halifax explosion. Uh, while well, wealthier areas to the south, uh, uh, especially south of the Citadel, which protected some of the blast, uh, were less impacted. And um, as well, Africville in the north was somewhat protected by the topography, uh, although it also sustained some damage. Uh, so the question uh, for tonight is, if we look at these pictures uh, in the aftermath of the explosion, the question is how uh, does a community get from looking something like this uh, in the immediate aftermath of a major disaster uh, to looking something like this uh, maybe just two or three years later? So this is a, a photo uh, of the North End, and in particular, this dense uh, uh, development here is what's now called the Hydrostone District in Halifax. Um, and this is a, a picture from 1921 uh, after uh, much of the reconstruction effort, uh, at least in the central portion of the neighborhood, has been uh, completed. Uh, so uh, what we're interested in then is kind of what Law's role is going to be in this transition uh, from uh, a, a severely impacted or destroyed community uh, to one that um, has been substantially reconstructed. Here you can see a close-up of, <coughs> uh, of one of the hydrogen houses, not uh, in the development, um, but further to the, uh, to the west. OK, so to start us off, uh, well, actually, so to start us off, I just wanted to uh, say a few intro notes about the presentation. So um, just to lay my cards on the table here, uh, this is a fairly new area of research for me. Uh, so uh, they, they tell you not to, to say that, but I'm going to say it anyways. <laughs> Uh, and I hope that, uh, and I expect that maybe there's some people here that you know, know a lot more about the Halifax explosion than I do, or maybe some of the other topics I'm going to talk about. Uh, I encourage you to please uh, you know, interject, uh, speak up, even correct me uh, if you think I'm going astray. Uh, I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 3,000 tons, not pounds. Uh, tons, yes, great. <laughs> Sorry. OK, good. So we're, we're off to a good start uh, already. Um, uh, uh, my, my role here really is then just to sort of open up the topic, uh, not a conventional topic, maybe so much for lawyers, uh, but one I think that actually, uh, uh, from a legal perspective, there might be some interesting sort of things to say. So just as a, an outline of the evening, I'm going to start by giving you a bit of the global context uh, 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 of sort of disasters, because I think the events of this past summer in uh, at Calgary and in Alberta, uh, in Quebec, uh, with the trained realm that were there, and in particular with the recent happenings in the Philippines, uh, it might be good to have some global context to, uh, to start out. Uh, then I'm going to talk about two major uh, sort of themes, that, uh, these sort of tensions that I see as really informing the development of law in this area, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, how that, I think, informs uh, the law of disaster recovery. And then I'm going to canvas uh, a sort of hodgepodge of legal issues uh, that I hope might be of interest to you and that I think are sort of informed uh, by these uh, tensions or conflicts. And then we'll, we'll maybe have some time, hopefully, for discussion and, and uh, questions. OK. Uh, so, the global context. Uh, I'm going to be focusing mostly tonight on reconstruction scenarios. So, um, uh, not uh, so much on the immediate response to a disaster uh, or emergency uh, relief, uh, things of that nature. Uh, going to be really focusing, uh, as it, the title indicates, on uh, the sort of the reconstruction of neighborhoods. And I'm going to be focusing mainly on urban areas uh, because I think it's uh, uh, something that's most alive in the media and uh, because often that's where the most people are impacted uh, and also poses some particular problems uh, for some of the issues uh, that we're going uh, to talk about. So 
to start us off, then, looking at the global scenario, this is a sort of map of uh, the kinds of disasters in 2012 that were recorded uh, by uh, something called the International Disaster Database. Um, and so these are disasters. Uh, uh, there's sort of various criteria, but 10 people or more, uh, 100 are, are killed or, or uh, 100 or more are affected, uh, or a declaration of emergency. So the idea is that these are fairly major disasters uh, by one definition or another. Uh, and so uh, what you can see is that the, the incidences of um, uh, floods in particular are on the rise. Uh, uh, this is, accounts for the largest proportion, uh, proportion of events. Uh, wind storms and other extreme uh, temperatures. Uh, and, and the trends in general seem to indicate that uh, uh, these are uh, indisputably obviously on the rise with the particular effects of, of global warming, uh, climate change, and um, uh, the world is likely to only uh, run up against these more and more frequently. Other kinds of disasters, uh, such as earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, these seem to have been pretty stable uh, over at least the past half century. Uh, and uh, uh, technological disasters, uh, in particular, transportation, uh, transport incidents, uh, and industrial accidents are uh, account for a major proportion of what happens on an, uh, an international scale. So because I'm going to be talking about reconstruction, uh, just a few statistics about, uh, about the kind of cost of these disasters. Uh, obviously, there's an enormous toll in terms of human lives. Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, reconstruction, uh, of neighborhoods, we might also want to look at the sort of numbers in terms of economic damage. So uh, it seems like these uh, events are not only getting more frequent and more severe, uh, they're also uh, costing substantially more. Uh, so the uh, disasters cost the world in particular in 2011, at the time of the uh, uh, Japanese earthquake, uh, $374 billion. Uh, the numbers for last year were uh, less than that, $157 uh, billion, although with the effects of Hurricane Sandy in the States, uh, uh, accounting for a major proportion of that. Uh, and then in 2005, Katrina, uh, you can see a bump there uh, when the hurricanes hit the southern United States. So uh, in terms of uh, here, uh, the floods in Alberta, uh, the re most recent ex estimates are that they will cost around uh, six, uh, six billion dollars. Uh, uh, to re recover from the damages there, um, and also substantial damages uh, in, in Quebec. So um, the idea here is that the costs of these disasters are rising to such an extent that uh, local uh, governments and in provinces are, are struggling to uh, bear the burden of the costs. And uh, uh, as we're going to talk about a little more tonight, the federal government uh, is becoming more and more involved in uh, trying to make a response to these disasters. Okay. Uh, so now I want to talk uh, about these uh, sort of competing values or competing impulses that seem to lie at the heart of a lot of disaster uh, scenarios. Uh, it's uh, hard to imagine events that are uh, sort of more disruptive to uh, the social order uh, than uh, disasters such as a major explosion, like the one in Halifax, the floods in Calgary, uh, or the uh, train derailment in, uh, in Quebec. Uh, people are forced out of their homes and neighborhoods. Uh, they often leave, and uh, many don't come back. Uh, uh, and this compounds itself as others stay away. People don't want to return to their neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhood blight starts to take hold. Uh, economic activity uh, slows often uh, to a near halt, and it becomes quite difficult to do even the most day-to-day uh, -day activities, uh, in addition to public infrastructure and public institutions uh, struggling to function effectively at all. So the first of these kind of core tensions uh, I want to talk about uh, are what I call the, the, the tension between uh, going it alone uh, versus everybody uh, pitches in. So the idea here is that uh, on the one side, uh, people uh, really want to take charge and have control over the rebuilding process uh, uh, after a disaster. Uh, and in particular, they want to sort of uh, move to reassert control over their own lives. Uh, against that, people also seem to be drawn to uh, uh, work with others as part of collective efforts to rebuild and reestablish their lives uh, and to help each other out in uh, sometimes surprisingly altruistic ways. So uh, 
the idea uh, on the one side with going it alone is that the experience of a disaster uh, sort of takes away or restricts one's personal autonomy uh, uh, to act in the world uh, and one's freedom to shape his or her own, uh, her own life. So often this is a result of a lack of access just to basic necessities. Uh, people are driven from their homes, uh, neighborhoods, the most kind of intimate and private aspects of their lives. Uh, it's also, I think, a product of uh, this idea, which is kind of the overwhelming power of, uh, of nature or technological phenomena in the face of a disaster in which people feel uh, ultimately pretty helpless uh, and, uh, as a response, uh, are desperate to reassert some kind of control over their, uh, over their lives. And in fact, when we look at uh, cross-national uh, sort of studies of, of this and rebuilding, we see that uh, people uh, report that they, they are more satisfied and they're much happier uh, with uh, the reconstruction efforts that happen once, uh, or once uh, they have control uh, over decisions about where to rebuild, uh, how quickly, and uh, where they want to locate. Uh, the darker side, I think, of this tension is that people tend to act pretty selfishly in some situations. Uh, they are inward looking, they're concerned about their own welfare, their own safety and privacy, uh, and they're mainly seeking to get back and restructure their uh, own lives, sometimes blinded to the larger aspects of uh, community. So uh, this, I think, this idea is connected uh, intimately with uh, the idea of private insurance uh, and the role of private insurance in, uh, in disaster uh, scenarios. So um, the idea here is that people uh, uh, want to reassert control over their lives is directly related to uh, their individual responsibility for doing just that. So in Canada, we rely very heavily on private insurance markets to pay for individuals to rebuild their homes uh, and businesses uh, or cover damages from lost property. Uh, and this is unlike car insurance, for example, in Canada, in which people aren't legally required to uh, carry uh, insurance on their home to protect against damages and catastrophic events. Okay? Uh, it might be required by your mortgager, for example, uh, but uh, uh, it's not a legal requirement, uh, at least in Canada. And we might ask, uh, then, why that is the case. Um, why is it not required by law? And and or why doesn't government simply guarantee compensation in the aftermath of a disaster? Um, and I think the economists will tell us that there is effectively sort of two rationales for why it is we rely so heavily on private insurance to fund uh, the majority, at least, of private redevelopment uh, in a disaster. So one is based on this idea of changes in behavior, uh, or what economists call moral hazard problems. So uh, if people have some choice about uh, the amount of insurance they want to buy, about how much risk they want to take on, uh, then they're going to take steps uh, to act in less riskier ways, uh, maybe uh, find ways to make their houses stronger, for example, to raise their basements, uh, to mitigate against uh, uh, future risks. Uh, and conversely, if people know that someone else will pay, uh, then they're going to engage in unnecessarily risky behavior. Uh, such as uh, knowingly building their house on a floodplain uh, is an example that's come up uh, pretty recently in light of recent events. Okay, so uh, one rationale here of why we have this kind of private insurance orientation is because uh, changes in behavior. The other idea is that uh, there's some kind of amount of expertise uh, that's involved. So expertise from private insurers that are better able, able to uh, uh, create cost-effective insurance, uh, segregate risks. I won't go into the details, but uh, there's something that private insurers can do well, uh, and maybe governments can't do so well. So as it stands, uh, the idea is that we mostly rely on private insurance uh, in order to uh, fund people to reconstruct, uh, in particular, their homes and businesses. Okay, public funding, uh, donations, uh, uh, and the like, largely then fill in around the edge at least for middle and upper class uh, home and business owners. And they also fund, to some extent, the uh, rebuilding of public infrastructure. So as I said, I think there's probably a close connection here between the sort of go it alone type of value and the it's up to you kind of attitude uh, that we take when we use private insurance markets to act as a sort of baseline uh, for funding disaster uh, recovery. Um, so you've already probably uh, identified some of the uh, important gaps uh, or problems with this kind of an idea. Uh, one is that, uh, as many Albertans found out, to their great surprise this summer, uh, their homes were not insured for what we call overland flood uh, damage. 
Uh, and I think probably in light of that, there's a lot of Canadians going into their drawers and looking at their home insurance policies uh, and trying to uh, make sense of uh, what it is they're covered for and not. Uh, the idea, though, is that uh, at least in Canada, overland flood insurance uh, isn't uh, a, a, a part of, normally part of uh, what you'd call an insured peril. So the idea is that uh, it's uh, something that is supposedly predictable. If you live in a floodplain, you know you're going to be uh, susceptible to kind of damage in a way that you wouldn't be uh, for wind events or fire uh, that are spread more evenly across the population. And that, in other words, this kind of covers a smaller slice so that it's less economical for private insurers to, uh, to get into the game, although there's increasing pressure, I think, uh, for that to happen. Uh, the other, another issue is uh, what if private insurance simply is enough to cover the damage when things get really bad? Uh, 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 hard to know how bad these events are going to be, and sometimes private insurance uh, just isn't going to cover it, uh, uh, and so that's another kind of gap. Uh, the other thing we might ask is what about renters, for example? Uh, their homes get destroyed too in a disaster, and the sort of do-it-yourself uh, outlook seems to imply that people might be pretty concerned with their own ends. Uh, and isn't this going to leave renters in the lurch some of the time? In particular, these renters are uh, likely to be some, potentially some of them more marginalized people uh, in society, and uh, uh, we ought uh, maybe to be thinking fairly careful about how that plays into um, this uh, focus on private insurance markets. Okay, so uh, the second idea here, as against the uh, uh, do-it-yourself or go at it alone kind of value is uh, everybody gets together, okay? So this is the other side in which disasters not only drive people to want to kind of reassert control over their own lives, uh, but also uh, push people together uh, to act collectively, uh, to act cooperatively uh, in ways that are actually sometimes pretty difficult even under normal uh, conditions of day-to-day -day life. Okay, this is often not the picture we get from media coverage of disasters, uh, which tend to be much more interested in images of thievery, uh, violence, and the breakdown of social order. Uh, uh, what makes the news stories is about uh, people often looking after themselves, uh, or worse, hurting others, uh, than about people acting altruistically or cooperatively. Okay, this seems much more like a story about the dark side of go at it alone, uh, rather than everyone getting together. Um, it turns out, though, that uh, that may not be uh, the case. So uh, Rebecca Solnit, uh, who's an American author and journalist, has written uh, a pretty remarkable book called A Paradise Built in Hell, in which she uh, traces a number of disaster events uh, uh, through history, touches a bit on the Halifax disaster, and uh, really challenges these, uh, what she calls disaster myths, that post-disaster situations are uh, ripe with uh, looters and thieves. Uh, and that uh, there is a disintegration of the social order most of the time. Uh, she argues that people actually tend to realize huge benefits from coordinating their actions after a disaster. Uh, and they respond to the isolating or intimidating effects, uh, often by strengthening social bonds. So one example she gives is in Mexico City after the 1985 earthquake. Uh, 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 an earthquake that killed, I think, more than about 10,000 people in that city. Uh, that was actually the kind of groundswell for a rebirth of civil society in that, uh, in that country, in that region, uh, as residents responded to a vacuum created by government action and uh, a long history of government corruption uh, by uh, sort of self-organizing and uh, 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 promoting uh, uh, then, going forward, established things like labor movements uh, that were crucially involved in the rebuilding. Later, we'll touch on another example in New Orleans uh, when we talk a little bit about neighborhood associations and how people self-organize on that level. So um, if we apply this to the Halifax uh, situation, getting back to the Halifax disaster, uh, the, this impulse to coordinate and cooperate manifested itself in a different kind of way. So uh, within hours after the explosion in Halifax, an informal group of local politicians, uh, lawyers, philanthropists, uh, and other citizens uh, uh, met together to form what was uh, at that time called the Halifax Relief Committee. Uh, uh, so this was a group of people uh, from the community who had no real experience in disaster relief uh, or emergency measures, uh, but they took on some crucial roles in organizing emergency shelter uh, provisions uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, 
uh, this community of people then was, was rapidly on, uh, uh, sort of moving to a, a legal lens, was rapidly institutionalized uh, uh, in the form of the Halifax Relief Commission, uh, which was appointed uh, by the federal government uh, within about a, a month or so, I think sometime within, uh, in January of 1918, uh, by a, a federal order in council. Uh, and so this was uh, three folks, uh, two judges and a former mayor of Oshawa. Uh, that were appointed uh, to uh, uh, carry out the sort of duties uh, that were then subsequently bestowed on the committee. Uh, so after they were appointed, provincial legislation uh, stepped in and uh, granted this uh, small committee of people what were, uh, in retrospect, remarkably broad powers to uh, not only manage uh, the monies uh, that were coming in for relief efforts and for reconstruction, uh, but also to uh, the power to effectively make plans for implementing reconstruction in the uh, damaged neighborhoods, uh, the power to expropriate any lands that they needed, uh, the power uh, then also to control and disperse uh, all the monies that were required for all of this, uh, which I think uh, uh, ultimately amounted to about uh, $25 million or thereabouts in relief funds from various, uh, from various sources. So uh, in a world uh, of 1917 and like today, uh, private uh, insurance was likely not as widely available. And so this uh, small committee of people uh, would, would play a crucial role in coordinating reconstruction efforts uh, in, the, in the damaged neighborhoods. Uh, but we also, uh, as part and parcel of this, see some important counter currents. Uh, one is that a, a small commission uh, uh, of legal and civic leaders, uh, although they might be fairly effective at organizing uh, relief and reconstruction, were also seen as relatively elitist and disconnected from people's concerns and problems uh, on the ground. And so we see uh, uh, this idea that they're going ahead with their plans and in some of the newspaper coverage of the time uh, that people aren't particularly engaged or aware of uh, what's happening. Uh, one example, uh, just a small example of this is that uh, uh, there's reports of when people were offered the choice between uh, uh, effectively getting a payout of reconstruction funds or having the HRC uh, uh, build them a house and sometimes become a mortgager uh, for their new home, uh, they opted sort of out of the collective effort uh, and for sort of individual control over their own, uh, over their own uh, rebuilding efforts. Uh, and so uh, some important countercurrents here uh, we see getting back to the idea of people wanting to, uh, to do it on their own. Okay, so the, the second kind of conflict of values that I, I wanted to touch on uh, was this idea um, uh, of back to the future or return to the status quo uh, versus uh, don't, don't miss out on this chance or uh, the uh, agony of opportunity that comes along in, uh, with disasters at certain points. So uh, starting on the uh, one side with this idea of back to the future, uh, the idea here is that uh, people in post-disaster situations will want security, comfort, and uh, return to the familiar. Uh, there's a real craving to get back to what people know, uh, and people are hesitant or suspicious of things that are transformative or new. Uh, what they really want to do is uh, preserve as much of their former lives as possible, uh, and they're anxious to restore the status quo quickly and without delay. Uh, so... Uh, Bob Ellickson, who's a, an American legal scholar and an urban historian, has studied this uh, phenomenon uh, uh, by looking at uh, the changes in street layouts following a disaster. Uh, and what he uh, finds is that even where streets are, are badly laid out or confusing, uh, uh, it's, it's rarely, uh, if ever, the case that they get redesigned in the wake of an urban disaster. Uh, even though this would seem like an ideal time in which to actually go ahead and do that, uh, particularly in instances uh, something like Hiroshima, in which uh, the city was uh, almost entirely, uh, uh, or neighborhoods were almost entirely wiped out, uh, you would think that this would be an ideal or opportune time to uh, get in and redesign streets. So Ellickson uh, says uh, this doesn't happen uh, most of the time in his findings, and this is just one example uh, uh, taken from his paper uh, uh, recently released on the topic in which uh, he shows Hiroshima pre-disaster in 1945 uh, and in 2008 uh, in which other than 
uh, the Peace Park at the sort of epicenter of the explosion, uh, there really was very little change uh, in, uh, in the street layouts as they existed. And he has sort of two reasons why, which I think are important for us in thinking more generally about post-disaster reconstruction. Um, the first is that uh, pre-existing layouts provide a sort of focal point uh, around which uh, residents can coordinate their expectations and their reconstruction efforts. So uh, residents, when they come back to a community after a disaster, uh, already have a map in their mind, uh, and that's the map of uh, the pre-existing layout uh, in which they uh, had been living. The second idea is, uh, draws on an insight from cognitive psychology, uh, which is that residents will often value uh, the, uh, the restoration of their neighborhood's pre-existing layout more than they'll value any gains associated with an alternative or equally meritorious layout. So the basic notion here is that uh, people will often place higher value on what they know, uh, on what they've already got, uh, rather than um, uh, uh, something that maybe by some objective measure can be shown to be equally or more valuable. Uh, so based on these kind of two uh, explanations, uh, Ellison argues that uh, there's a very strong pull back toward the status quo uh, for his example of street layouts, but we could think more generally about the reconstruction of neighborhoods after a disaster. Okay, so uh, on the other side of this idea of back to the future or return to the status quo uh, is uh, the notion that we don't want to miss out on this opportunity uh, for uh, making new plans and engaging in urban uh, or community innovations uh, after a disaster. So uh, the idea that after the destruction of a physical environment, uh, people are operating with a relatively clean slate. And uh, with appropriate planning and deliberation, uh, you could address some long-standing social inequalities uh, or perhaps past mistakes uh, that you've made. So this, I think, is a pretty illustrative quote uh, that was made by Michael Sorkin, who's an architectural critic in the US following Katrina. Uh, and he said, well, it would be callous to talk about 9-11 or Katrina as having silver linings, uh, both have wiped the slate clean, to uh, reflexively reproduce the status quo ante without vigorously questioning both its values and its defects would slight the disaster and obscure the urgency of opportunity. Okay, so uh, a sort of strong statement of uh, this idea that um, there's often good opportunities for uh, sort of urban innovation and planning. So this uh, kind of tension often ends up uh, setting up uh, or pitting uh, experts uh, in a community, in particular urban planners, uh, lawyers, uh, other kinds of uh, experts against local residents and non-experts uh, who may more strongly feel, feel this pullback toward the, the status quo. Uh, so this was a main feature of uh, New Orleans after the uh, rebuilding uh, in that city after Katrina in 2005. Uh, where there was some extensive city planning processes that were, uh, that were taking place, uh, and a number of citywide plans over a number of years, in fact, uh, were drafted uh, and some rejected, uh, uh, creating uh, a lot of conversation, but also some uh, sub substantial delay and frustration. Uh, this map has now become quite famous, uh, I think, at least uh, uh, in people thinking about post catastrophe reconstruction uh, after Katrina. Uh, this is called the controversial green, green dot plan. Uh, in which uh, urban planners came up with this idea that there's going to be a lot of urban blight following, uh, following uh, uh, the disaster. Uh, not a lot of people are going to be returning, and so they need to do something with uh, this space. These green dots represented spots that they thought would be good places to build city parks. Uh, they often tended to be in the poorer neighborhoods, uh, often the uh, black neighborhoods of the city, uh, and this caused, uh, understandably, quite a backlash. Uh, you can see uh, it became a symbol almost for uh, sort of uh, uh, this struggle between uh, what re local residents saw as a struggle between uh, uh, local control or autonomy uh, versus uh, expertise uh, and social engineering at the, at the city level. Okay, this was also an important theme in Halifax, uh, if we go back to 1917. Uh, uh, the Halifax explosion coincided with uh, a pretty interesting time in urban planning generally. Uh, and shortly after the uh, HRC, the Relief Commission, got together, uh, they, uh, they recruited a, a famous British planner in the name of Thomas Adams, uh, who had been kind of instrumental in the City Beautiful movement uh, in Europe. Uh, 
who got together with a uh, Montreal architect named George Ross uh, to embark on some very ambitious planning around the reconstruction and the replanning of the devastated neighborhood. Uh, and this is uh, uh, really uh, uh, how the hydrostone development uh, and the surrounding neighborhood came to be, uh, came to be developed. So uh, you can see here, this is a comparison uh, of the original street plan uh, of the North End Richmond neighborhood uh, before the uh, explosion, and then uh, a representation of Thomas Adams' reconstruction plan, uh, uh, <clears throat> thinking about planning after the disaster. And so, you know, just a, a, a quick look at this seems to, <clears throat> excuse me, seems to uh, uh, push back against this thesis that, for example, it's not a good time to redo street layouts uh, after a disaster. It seems that Thomas Adam uh, was anxious to do just that uh, following the disaster. Uh, his idea was that he wanted to effectively create a plan in uh, three parts. Uh, this dense area you see in the middle here uh, is the hydrostone development uh, uh, that was planned to be, uh, at the beginning at least, rental housing uh, for uh, mainly for former residents of the neighborhood. Uh, to, the, uh, to the west, or, Sorry, to the east uh, uh, was on the hill, uh, and down uh, toward the water was set aside for um, uh, wealthier uh, residents uh, who were planning to come back and build uh, what Adams called better quality homes at the time. Uh, to the west of the hydrostone then was the poorer neighborhood uh, in which uh, they ultimately ended up constructing some more ramshackle housing. Uh, and so the idea here was that in effect the hydrostone was act as a sort of social screen or curtain between the richer areas uh, and the poorer area of the neighborhood, uh, uh, reflecting uh, ideas about uh, social planning at the time. Uh, against these sort of extensive planning ambitions then, uh, we also saw uh, some considerable backlash from residents uh, who uh, not only wanted to get back to their old neighborhoods, uh, but also want, uh, resented a lack of voice in the IRC process. Uh, and uh, uh, contemporary reports at the time uh, talk, uh, uh, sort of uh, represent some of this backlash. Uh, an Ottawa reporter uh, uh, actually, I think, has a, a very illustrative quote uh, in talking about this struggle between uh, sort of city planners and local elites and local residents. And the uh, quotation is that uh, the North End will prefer democracy, uh, but it's a question of whether democracy included the right to build up another shack town for children of Halifax industrial workers to grow up in. So uh, the idea here that uh, people uh, wanted a voice or say or some control in the reconstruction of their neighborhoods, um, but, quite, uh, but elites at the time were questioning whether or not um, this was going to sort of reproduce some of the social ills that had existed uh, prior to the explosion. Okay, uh, as a side note, uh, as it turns out, uh, Adam's plans were uh, substantially unrealized, uh, at least uh, uh, in this area more to the north uh, of these developments, although the hydrostone development did go ahead. Uh, uh, it seems that some of his uh, really ambitious planning uh, was curbed to some extent by uh, the pragmatics of reconstruction and maybe to some extent by the backlash. Okay, so um, those are the, the sort of two, uh, as I said, major uh, uh, conflicts of values that I think maybe sit at the heart of uh, what a lot of uh, law and policy deals with in Canada when we confront uh, post-disaster scenarios. Um, so now I want to turn to some more sort of specific issues uh, in, uh, uh, in the law of post-disaster reconstruction um, where some of these tensions arise. So the first question uh, that I want to deal with is, is effectively who is responsible for uh, public disaster re uh, recovery funding in Canada? We've already looked a little bit at uh, private insurance, okay, and how that seems to play into uh, funding people's recovery efforts. Um, but as we mentioned before, there's uh, going to be lots of instances in which uh, this is going to be inadequate and which there's going to be gaps, uh, and clearly government plays an important role here. So uh, starting with the province, um, the province of Nova Scotia, for example, uh, sort of sits as a main player in responding to uh, disasters that occur, uh, that occur here. So uh, as a starting point, they're responsible for declaring an emergency situation uh, when it exists under the Emergency Management Act, okay, under the Provincial Emergency Management Act. Uh, and uh, once they've declared a disaster exists, uh, then they designate a disaster-affected area. 
okay, within which residents, small businesses, and nonprofits may be eligible for uh, relief funding uh, for disaster-related damages. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of critical first step uh, in which uh, uh, the, the provincial government designates people as being eligible uh, for uh, disaster assistance funding. Uh, so once uh, that's happened, then the disaster uh, uh, the actual assistance is uh, administered by the Nova Scotia Emergency Management Act uh, in the form of a provincial program uh, for funding. And so uh, I won't get into all the details of the uh, requirements of the eligibilities under that program, but uh, as it stands right now, uh, there's a maximum payout of about $80,000 for uh, individuals and small businesses, uh, about 200,000 for nonprofits, uh, organizations uh, who qualify. Uh, and uh, uh, funds can be designated to restore property effectively to uh, pre-disaster conditions. Uh, there's also, as I'll, I'll mention at the end, uh, some of that uh, uh, that allows for mitigation measures to reduce future vulnerabilities uh, for Actually, it doesn't have to be declared. Uh, you just need a disaster that happens over one percent of the uh, per capita. Okay. So if it's nine hundred forty thousand here. Then we can. If the disaster has been shown, it no longer has to be declared. It no longer has to be declared. It's, it's sort of kicks in on that. Because we've only had one declared. I think it was White One is the only one that has declared disaster in the last number of years. Okay. And how do they define the boundaries then of the uh, the effect area? That's it. If 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 there's an amount of damage is over nine hundred forty thousand dollars. Okay. One percent then the formula kicks in, the feds will pay so much um, on the, uh, the over 940,000, and yeah. then there's formula after that. Okay. But it, it doesn't have to be declared. Okay, That's great. Okay, so, um, uh, uh, so uh, it, it, after this sort of first initial step kick, kicked in, then um, then uh, we sort of get to the step in which the province uh, uh, coordinates uh, with the federal level uh, in these sort of cost sharing agreements uh, uh, the federal provincial disaster financial assistance agreements uh, that provide uh, for some federal kind of backstop funding uh, or share funding uh, with the province. Um, so this is probably, uh, at least in my understanding of the sort of landscape in Canada right now, the most important um, kind of role that the, the feds play uh, in terms of disaster recovery. Uh, for the most part, uh, they, uh, they don't, uh, they don't uh, get much involved in other aspects of disaster reconstruction, um, uh, something by comparison to the Halifax disaster in which they, they seem to be taking a much more uh, active role, although uh, from my reading, there's some criticisms that they should be, um, that they should be more involved. Uh, so uh, the idea here with these, uh, these uh, uh, disaster financial assistance agreements uh, is that uh, the province uh, 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 can then initiate a request to the federal government uh, 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 and once the governor and council has declared that a disaster is within a matter of Canadian concern under the federal legislation, um, uh, then the, the federal government will uh, provide some proportional funding uh, for disaster relief. So uh, the idea here is that there's a sort of cost schedule uh, that, um, that applies for how much the feds will pay. So on a per capita basis, for every one dollar, uh, the provinces are responsible for that. Uh, the feds don't pay anything. For the next two dollars, they pay 50 percent. Uh, for the next two dollars after that, they pay 70. Uh, this is the federal government, and they'll pay uh, the remainder uh, at 90 percent uh, over that. So um, this sort of escalating um, uh, cost schedule uh, that the federal government is participating in, um, once, disaster, uh, once disasters get too expensive, uh, the idea, I think, is for local governments and local uh, authorities to bear. So um, there's been a pretty rapid expansion of this program uh, within the last uh, number of years. So the stats I've got are that from 1970 to 1996, uh, the program paid out on average about uh, $10 million annually. Uh, but then since 1996, uh, this average has been about $100 million annually, so about a tenfold uh, increase uh, in the amount of funding that um, is uh, being channeled through these disaster uh, financial assistance agreement programs. Uh, the feds do have some other additional uh, uh, ways, I think, of uh, helping people out through, uh, for example, uh, types of loan programs for homeowners through CMHC. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of those sorts of things. Uh, the province may also, I think, offer some small business funding, uh, loan funding for businesses. Um, but the bulk of the uh, financial relief assistance uh, comes through uh, the channels that I just discussed. Um, okay, so... Uh, I think uh, just to give you an example of this, then uh, in the Alberta situation from this past summer, um, uh, 
uh, I mentioned before that uh, private insurance doesn't cover uh, overland floods. Uh, and so the governments are, are now stepping in to, uh, having to step in to provide uh, in that province uh, a lot of reconstruction funding because most people are finding out that they're not covered uh, under their insurers. Uh, this, of course, leads back to the kind of moral hazard problem that uh, I was talking about before, is really what's to stop people then from going and rebuilding their homes uh, in the floodway and collecting compensation the next time. And I think this is an issue that the provincial government there uh, is struggling with. Uh, it seems that what they've said right now is uh, the Alberta government has said you can, uh, you can uh, collect this time uh, if your house exists uh, in a vulnerable area or in a floodway, uh, uh, but we're not going to be there next time if you choose to rebuild. And then there's also some incentives built in to uh, relocate, uh, although you can imagine people are facing some pretty dramatic choices because uh, if they're having to move out of these floodplains, then um, their houses aren't going to be worth much money if they need to sell it. Uh, on the housing market. So um, uh, I think this is a conundrum that people are, uh, the governments and the communities are confronting uh, across Canada. And uh, it seems that there is a lot of noises about the insurance companies getting involved in funding uh, 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 flood insurance, uh, but no one seems quite sure, at this point anyways, about exactly how to do that. Um, just a brief comparison with the, uh, with the US. Uh, so the US, uh, and we've heard quite a lot about it in the sort of aftermath of Katrina, has a, a substantially more, I think, complex sort of federal regulatory scheme to do with disaster recovery uh, in the form of what's called the Stafford Act uh, uh, and several sort of individualized programs to fund uh, uh, individuals, uh, businesses uh, across a sort of uh, menu of options. Uh, uh, the FEMA, the federal uh, emergency management agency that's uh, designated under the Stafford Act in the States uh, was heavily criticized in the wake of uh, uh, the hurricane in Katrina uh, for its sort of slow and inefficient handling of the disaster, its sort of uh, a botching of, of delivering reconstruction funds, uh, and in some sense poor leadership. And uh, there's been, I think, a substantial backlash in the States uh, against decisions being made at kind of this higher level and people sort of clamoring to assert uh, more kind of local control. Whether or not that, those are uh, sort of valid criticisms or uh, valid movements, I think maybe still remain to be seen. Um, although it seems that there's been some reforms uh, in the wake of those uh, criticisms. The, the other thing to notice about the American situation that I thought was quite interesting was that outside of the programs that are provided for under the Stafford Act, uh, are that um, there, uh, Congress has sort of substantial powers to, uh, uh, to authorize appropriations of additional funds for di uh, disaster uh, assistance. And um, they do so quite regularly and, and, and quite substantially. So uh, in the hurricanes after Katrina and Rita, uh, the, the Congress appropriated about $19.7 uh, billion for relief uh, uh, in those instances. Uh, the interesting thing about these appropriations is that Congress has the authority to tie conditions to the funding, uh, uh, which is something that seems to be more or less absent from the Canadian situation uh, in which funding is sort of just channeled through and any uh, conditions or decisions are made more at the local level. Uh, in the U.S., uh, Cong Congress, through these appropriations, kind of has wider scope uh, to uh, tie funding to special provisions that may, for example, impact lower income people, uh, make provision for them, uh, set things particular to environmental review standards or labor standards. Um, it gives the, the federal government substantially, I think, more control over um, how reconstruction happens. Uh, one other uh, sort of point of note uh, here that I thought was really interesting is what Ontario does uh, in terms of kind of organizing some of this relief funding. Um, uh, uh, they do something uh, that's called, uh, well, theirs is called a disaster relief assistance program. Um, but that once a, 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 an area is declared a disaster area, uh, the local municipal councils are required to appoint a disaster relief committee. Uh, and this sort of recalls, uh, I think, some of the history of what happened in Halifax in terms of creating uh, a sort of on the ground uh, council or committee of local individuals uh, who, in this instance, have a couple of responsibilities. So their primary responsibility is to raise funds to benefit disaster victims. Um, uh, to raise funds from sources outside of the government. And so uh, the idea here is that uh, to the extent uh, that the committee can raise funds uh, and allocate those to reconstruction, um, that's going to take priority, and then the government will fill in uh, with public funding in around that. And then the committee also has uh, authority or responsibility for uh, settling eligible claims uh, for individuals. 
Uh, and I think um, this kind of channels the idea of collective or cooperative action uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier uh, in a couple of different ways. I think the idea is that a local committee is, is more embedded in the immediate community uh, and they can, that can both help them to locate funding sources uh, more effectively and oversee claims in a way that's maybe regarded as more legitimate um, by the local community. Um, and also sort of draws on the altruism and fellow feeling uh, that comes along with the idea of uh, capturing fundraising as opposed to um, uh, uh, delegating uh, public funds. So I said I would return a little bit to talking about um, uh, the idea of how sort of local neighborhoods in uh, New Orleans uh, were involved in the reconstruction there. And um, for all the studies and kind of things I've read and seen about uh, what comes out of New Orleans, I think uh, this is probably uh, one of the most uh, interesting. And so, um, as I said before, there was a real struggle between uh, people who were planning at the sort of citywide level around um, uh, trying to create plans for the future of the city as a whole uh, and kind of local residences at, and neighborhoods who were trying to uh, uh, sort of map their own their own course. Uh, so uh, uh, Carl Seedman, who's an urban studies guy at uh, MIT, has uh, recently written this book called uh, Coming Home to New Orleans, in which uh, he sort of picks apart these planning uh, and reconstruction processes in New Orleans. And he really drills down to the neighborhood level and looks at what's happening uh, uh, with sort of really localized organizations and institutions and their sort of role uh, in rebuilding communities. So um, he focuses on, uh, in particular, on this one community called the, the Broadmoor community. Uh, in Halifax, which is uh, a sort of central community uh, right uh, close to the downtown uh, in the city. And uh, it's, it's fairly typical of the poorer neighborhoods uh, in the city. Uh, it has a, a poverty rate of about 30%. Uh, it's about 48% owner-occupied uh, homes uh, pre-Katrina, uh, so a relatively poor uh, uh, inner city sort of neighborhood. Uh, 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 typical of the neighborhoods that would be surrounding in this area, um, others that you hear about, uh, like the Lower Ninth Ward. So uh, what's interesting about this neighborhood is that they had a, a what was called the Broadmoor Improvement Association, which was uh, a pre-existing neighborhood association that mainly looked after uh, minor beautification uh, 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 in the neighborhood, uh, did some activities around neighborhood advocacy, uh, this sort of thing. Um, but after uh, the hurricane, this uh, local improvement organization uh, sort of really took off uh, and started to uh, engage in some pretty sophisticated uh, local planning processes, um, started to gather a lot of data about who was coming back to the community and who wasn't um, so that they could track uh, efforts at reconstruction, uh, uh, so that they could advocate to people who weren't returning uh, to show people that there were others who were, that they were so that they would sort of follow suit. Um, uh, and uh, just a lot of activities uh, sort of at this micro scale uh, in, uh, in the community. Uh, and what struck me when I was reading about this was that uh, from the legal sort of perspective, there sort of, was sort of two uh, uh, aspects of this um, uh, that I think could be maybe lessons uh, for uh, where law has a role to play. And one is uh, that the Neighborhood Association went on to use a, a community development corporation uh, to uh, give their sort of reconstruction efforts a sort of formal structure uh, through which they could uh, both raise money uh, and uh, attract investment funding uh, and also reach out to other institutions. And so they had uh, partnerships with uh, Harvard, uh, with MIT, uh, to uh, draw on some of their expertise, to use some of their students to come in the summer, uh, help them out with reconstruction efforts, uh, uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, and, and this community development corporation drew on what was a pretty well-established uh, network and sort of series of legislative supports uh, for these types of CDCs uh, in the area. Uh, and uh, uh, Seidman's analysis is that it was successful particularly because it was kind of embedded in this supportive institutional environment. Um, the second thing that was interesting was uh, uh, the Broadmoor community's use of these residential improvement districts uh, to strengthen their neighborhood association. So what was largely a voluntary association uh, to start with um, uh, was transformed into uh, one of these residential improvement districts in the US. And uh, in Louisiana anyways, there is state legislation to allow uh, neighborhood associations to apply 
uh, for one of these residential improvement districts. And the idea here is that once you become sort of certified, um, you, can, uh, you can levy uh, a, a, a fee on a property within uh, your neighborhood uh, to raise money effectively to run your neighborhood association. Uh, so uh, Broadmoor created theirs in 2010, uh, and they now levy about $100 a year parcel fee uh, for each owner in the community, uh, which allows them to have some operational funding to sort of go forward and um, uh, uh, be engaged in f uh, further planning and advocacy uh, uh, efforts around reconstruction in their neighborhood. Uh, I noted that in Halifax, uh, there's a bit of a precedent for something like this uh, because uh, 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 my understanding is that city has recently passed a, a bylaw to uh, regulate business improvement districts in the city. Uh, and so this is a similar idea in which businesses get together and uh, if they're approved under the bylaw uh, can uh, levy uh, uh, a fee on local business owners in order to uh, garner funds and then uh, engage in uh, activities like marketing or beautification or economic development. Um, and so uh, it seems to me that something like this stands as an interesting kind of legal uh, uh, legislative precedent uh, for uh, creating the kind of institutional environment that might support something like a residential improvement district, uh, 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 which might be quite instrumental in going forward in, in, in rebuilding after a disaster. Okay, um, I'm getting uh, toward the end here, but I wanted to touch quickly on uh, this question of what about renters. Uh, so I noted earlier that uh, people uh, who rent uh, uh, often can get left out in the uh, cold uh, after a disaster uh, because in particular, there is often a chronic shortage in rental housing uh, following a disaster event. Um, for a couple of reasons, I think people tend to delay rebuilding uh, if it's not their primary period residence. So uh, this kind of going back to the theme of uh, doing it yourself, uh, the idea is that uh, people are kind of going to be primarily concerned, at least in the uh, immediate phase, of getting back into their homes uh, and going to be worried about reconstructing their primary residences. Uh, this is going to uh, leave rental buildings or rental properties uh, at least somewhat down the road uh, if they ever get there. Uh, the other idea is that public relief assistance may not be available uh, for things beyond primary residence, uh, and this may also affect people's ability to rebuild income properties. And so the result of all this is that uh, there's uh, often, I think, a shortage of supply, a long-term shortage of supply in rental uh, housing following a disaster, uh, and it becomes very difficult for people to find affordable uh, accommodations. Uh, the other worry here is that um, uh, the sort of uh, skepticism about unscrupulous landlords uh, who might be uh, looking to take advantage of a, a post-disaster situation and charge uh, exorbitant rents. So uh, interestingly, this was a problem that was also confronting lawmakers in Nova Scotia after the uh, Halifax explosion. Um, as I mentioned before, the hydrozone development was intended to be uh, rent-controlled housing. Uh, uh, but wasn't ready until at least the sort of early 1920s uh, for people to move in. And in the meantime, uh, there was a real concern uh, about the supply of affordable housing for people. Um, and uh, the response to this was for the province to pass, I think, which in my understanding was a pretty early on landlord-tenant legislation uh, in order to uh, regulate some of this activity. Uh, so there was some initial uh, legislation passed uh, when the HRC was given its powers in 1918. And then in the next year, in 1919, the provincial legislature passed the Fair Rent Act. Uh, uh, which required a couple of things um, that tried to get around this problem or tried to meet this problem of affordable housing supply. Uh, one was that it required rents to be uh, fair and reasonable in the province, or in Halifax, I should say, um, and avoided any leases uh, where rents exceeded this standard. And so uh, it applied what was a fairly discretionary standard uh, in order to require, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, rents remained at a reasonable rate. Uh, it also banned fees or fines uh, that were applied to, uh, in the event of a renewal of a tenancy to, I think, prevent people from uh, uh, extorting uh, 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 or taking advantage of people uh, in that way of charging them uh, key money or something to that effect. Uh, and finally, it barred uh, judgments for ejectment of tenants uh, uh, unless they failed to pay their rent or they were creating a nuisance or, or something to that extent. So um, some pretty important protection for, uh, uh, for, for tenants at the time uh, that were sort of meant to address this, uh, this, uh, this problem. Uh, as I said, uh, 
the hydrostone itself was uh, sort of a longer term solution to this by providing, uh, at least in the initial phase of that development, rental housing uh, for people. Uh, the development remained owned by the Halifax uh, uh, Relief Commission uh, and was rented out to uh, tenants, at least I think until the mid 50s or early 60s, uh, after which those properties were uh, sold off to private individuals. Um, but I thought this was interesting because it also illustrates some of the real challenges in trying to um, uh, address uh, problems in housing markets after a disaster. And you see in some of the contemporary accounts uh, complaints about um, uh, huge vacancy rates in the Hydrostone as of um, this article in 1923. Um, uh, people complaining that rents were too high and that there were, um, there were huge um, vacancy rates in the buildings uh, at the time. I'm not sure what the explanation for this uh, might actually be, uh, but I think it just sort of stands as an example uh, or a representation of uh, how difficult it may be to sort of confront these, uh, these, these problems by, um, uh, by getting into the uh, rental markets. Uh, okay, so um, I'm kind of coming to an end here. I just wanted to uh, make a final mention that I haven't talked uh, much at all about what I think is actually a really, really important issue, uh, which is how uh, disaster mitigation gets uh, 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 sort of rolled in or might be regulated in reconstruction efforts. Um, uh, the idea here is that when you're rebuilding after a disaster, this is obviously uh, a really important time to be thinking ahead to the future about uh, making uh, homes and communities more resilient for uh, potential future uh, risks. And my understanding is that uh, in Canada right now, there's a lot of discussions going around excuse me, on around a national disaster mitigation strategy uh, uh, that's meant to co coordinate efforts at the federal and provincial levels uh, uh, to, um, uh, to require people to come up with mitigation plans and plan on sort of larger uh, scale uh, and focus on broader public investment projects, uh, things like the Red River floodway in Manitoba uh, after the floods there in the 1950s. Um, there's some positive developments, uh, I think, in Nova Scotia has a climate change adaptation fund to fund particular projects here in the province. Province. Um, but it looks like uh, we've yet to see something emerge as a sort of coordinated effort on a, a national scale. Uh, as far as sort of smaller uh, scale efforts, and, and in particular in, in terms of inducing people uh, in the private realm to uh, take into account mitigation when they're reconstructing their homes and businesses, um, it seems that uh, it may be important uh, to think about things like a part of Nova Scotia's program where there's allowances for uh, relief mitigation me uh, measures uh, in the funding that's allocated for relief. Um, uh, a stronger approach, I think, would be to tie conditions uh, uh, to relief funding that required mitigation me measures, uh, and uh, we may, I think, start to see some of that uh, as well uh, going forward. So uh, I think I'll stop there uh, and I'll open it up to any questions and answer any as best I can, or we can have a conversation for those um, who have things to add to the conversation. Um, uh, but yeah, so does anybody have anything that they would like to... Thanks so much. It's very interesting uh, to hear uh, about this. And I'm wondering if you have any comment about when a party is at fault, uh, like in the train derailment or Swiss Air. Um, it must end up in court for years, and the DFA and all that gets caught into it, and then someone would go bankrupt. Um, how, how, does that, uh, how does that work? Uh, of course, they probably start from a point that they're not liable, and then uh, it, go, it goes from there. Sure. Yeah, that falls a bit outside of my field of, uh, of expertise. I mean, uh, you can imagine, I mean, in the Halifax explosion, uh, for example, there was years of litigation, my understanding, following who was at fault uh, uh, there for uh, the cause of the explosion, and um, uh, uh, someone found at fault might be then liable to pay some of the costs. Um, I, heard, I don't actually know, uh, you know, what extent, how far those um, damages might run in a kind of a civil litigation suit uh, of that kind, but. Um, uh, I'm sure that's something that we'll be watching closely, and as you say, in Quebec, where that seems to be a sort of I think in Halifax, the uh, extended legislation or a uh, court case to the run out with just two ships fighting with each other. Yes. None of that money went to the uh, Eventually, we were found equally to blame. There was no money went into the re reconstruction of suing uh, the two companies. Yes. So, um, I think like my critique will be much more interested from a legal point of view because there um, we have a, a very small railway uh, that is now bankrupt, uh, part of a much bigger railway, how much will actually come into the provincial coffers. 
But in the meantime, the government is stepping in to, I think, essentially see that the reconstruction is done. And they'll fight it in the courts, perhaps for years. Um, and I know that the, uh, that the federal government and the British government had uh, you know, sort of divided and offered funding, uh, relief funding now for, uh, for uh, the town that I was going to see that they are saying that their estimates of the damage uh, are probably going to be far in excess of uh, what's being offered right now. So uh, it seems like um, there's still more to come. The uh, references to automobiles are always <coughs> always seductive in these things, and I was just reflecting in the comments about automobile insurance. And I, I think the public law leaves us in exactly the same situation with automobiles as it does with houses or anything else in the sense that you buy a car, and the degree to which the owner assumes the risk of loss of the asset is up to the owner. So we do, we do have to carry public liability and public damage insurance, yes. but the car itself can be left uninsured. Yes, exactly. It's simply up to the owner. Yes, exactly. And I guess the idea there is that because car accidents uh, presumably affect other parties that uh, we want to uh, uh, protect people, their... People build their homes in the same way that they build their cars. Exactly. They have to have PLDD insurance for houses right. too. And the other item is, uh, is reflecting on, on your comments on the, the, uh, the neighborhood associations in New Orleans. And we have in the past had pretty much the same sort of legislation in Nova Scotia. I don't know if there are any of these things left in terms of ratepayers associations, mm -hmm. uh, one of which was the Bedford Ratepayers Association in the, in the late 1970s uh, in the context of landfill. It was the reason why there's, there was never a dump in Jack Lake because it actually contested that with the provincial and the Halifax Dartmouth Regional Authority and made a decision at a public meeting to self-fund the contest of the Supreme Court of Canada to beat that one down. And it worked out really well because when, when they approved the funding at that town hall meeting, it was just added on to the county rate everybody paid. It was very, very effective. Right. And right. it's a shame that that's not really available much anymore. I didn't think it would be a great piece of public legislation that a ratepayers association could be formed to do that. Yes. No, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, partly, I think, a, yeah, a sort of a legal question and partly a sort of social cultural question in the sense that, uh, you know, if people see themselves as really, you know, wanting to act and participate in those kinds of, uh, in those kinds of community, uh, it's going to be something that's on people's radar. The usual obstruction is a high cost of litigation, and this was a solution to that. Yes, yes, yeah. Interesting. I mean, I think it, it, for me, it illustrates a kind of broader point about uh, uh, these kinds of institutions in the sort of construction context is that one thing we often don't think about is maybe playing an important role uh, in these sort of more catastrophic scenarios. They actually turn out to be pretty important. Um, they're sort of uh, sleepers in, in some sense. Uh, they kind of uh, come alive, uh, as you saw in the kind of problem, for example. And I expect that probably if you go looking at other examples of, of that um, uh, in sort of local in the case of Bedford, it wasn't a natural disaster, but it was a crisis sure, yeah. that was precipitated in another way, and the organization responded to it. I'll give you a citation for the Supreme Court of Canada case. Yes. <laughs> uh, is there any other questions? Yeah. Got any thoughts on mitigation prior to initial construction? We have all kinds of buildings on mud plains and shorelines. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. It's, uh, they should be dealing with this before they build initially, get approval for some of these locations. Right. Well, I mean, it seems to me that this is kind of part of the, uh, the sort of broader context of creating a sort of mitigation strategy. So either you know, on a provincial scale or coordinated on a national scale, um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the best time to do that is obviously before some yeah. point in best, uh, doing best doing it. Um, uh, uh, and I think there's a bit of a, people are, are kind of, it's not part of it, politically stuck now, uh, because obviously uh, uh, people that have already built there uh, are, are very concerned about um, uh, you know, how they're basically going to get themselves out of that situation. Um, but I know that there's, you know, there's a scripture, if you think a lot more deeply about these kinds of, addressing these kind of adaptation questions than, uh, than I have, but uh, that certainly seems like a huge concern. Where do you see Canada's greatest concern when it comes to future natural disasters? Uh, in terms of types of disasters, or in terms of... Uh, where, where do you think we should be paying attention to? Coming here. Maybe this is not something you've thought of, or you're just going to mitigate. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 in the kind of course of kind of doing some of this research, um, it seems to me that um, 
on a sort of on a on a, on a sort of broader level, I think uh, we need to think more deeply about uh, what levels of government, for example, uh, we want uh, participating in particular ways. So uh, this idea, I think, that uh, the federal government should be more involved, uh, that there can be things that they uh, can be doing to be sort of guiding the course, uh, is a really important piece of that uh, picture. Uh, but in line with this kind of tension it's seeing, I think uh, we also kind of tend to ignore the very local level stuff that's going on. So I'd like to see uh, more thinking about how uh, a plan for uh, uh, these kinds of local institutions, and so not in the broader example where things just kind of happen up spontaneously, but maybe that we have uh, some forward thinking things in place in order to uh, uh, create the conditions uh, to make that possible um, uh, when it's often hard to do so in a certain process. Or something. So like uh, the, the pull towards the status quo that you've seen often, <coughs> Um, that's really depressing because I always thought that disaster, I, I'm so the mindset that the silver lining, that people won't necessarily make the big changes that they need to make until they have to make them. And I always sort of assumed that disaster would be that sort of opportunity to make those changes. So I was wondering if you saw any, uh, in the cases where changes were made, like are there any rules or to sort of push for those kind of important changes that need to happen. Right. I mean, it seems to me that in particular the New Orleans experience uh, was uh, one in which uh, it was sort of it was really crucial to sort of get a buy-in uh, on, on one hand. So and they didn't try and do that. So uh, there, I said there was sort of a number of these kind of uh, uh, planning processes that were really directed towards this kind of uh, uh, taking advantage of the design moment uh, uh, and. Part of the early problem is because that was sort of too expert driven, and I think they learned their lesson a little bit and started to take uh, into account uh, sort of more voices. And so what they did, for example, is they went out uh, to places like Houston, where there was large populations of displaced residences, and they 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 they, uh, they held uh, big meetings or uh, a conference call uh, with uh, other residents who were in, back in New Orleans, and they sort of tried to coordinate these uh, sort of participatory access of, of the process. Uh, but the flip side of that, uh, I think, was that they also it seems once they came up with their plans, they really neglected to set priorities. Uh, so that's the kind of the kind of side of these really open participatory processes is that uh, you get a lot of feedback, but then if you fail to really set priorities uh, under conditions of limited funding, um, then that can also be uh, just another manner in which uh, the sort of design moment can fail and, and, and it really kind of crumbles from, from there. So uh, it does seem like uh, 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 there is some important lessons to be learned there. I actually tend to be quite optimistic after having read it. You know, that people are learning more from this. I didn't think, I think that this sort of idea of returning to the status quo uh, is a bit cynical or is a bit um, uh, disheartening, but I think it's also uh, one that is in kind of important to uh, take into account and not just sort of dismiss uh, because people do, I think, have these kind of important values at stake in which they, uh, they you know, want to feel secure and sort of control over. Um, I'll make a few suggestions where we should be concerned with Canada. It seems to me that a um, <clears throat> subduction zone earthquake uh, off the Vancouver Island is a certain beat within yes. 100 years. I was interested to just read that something like under 50% of uh, people in BC or in those zones, I think, have uh, earthquake insurance uh, left in us. So we have, we have the shaking of a very large earthquake plus the tsunami that will result. Um, I think it's called Mount Baker, but it's the equivalent of Mount St. Helens that uh, could and will eventually erupt with huge amounts of ash. Um, Winnipeg, by the way, while well, it's done a good job, it, uh, we know that in the past there's been far more meltwater than the floodway can ever handle. So you have a city of 400 or 500,000 people having to be evacuated. And wildfires, we've seen what they can do in British Columbia, and there will be more. And a big earthquake, the Fraser Delta, which Richmond sits on, will liquefy, and it's part of the slide. And then locally, rural, the hurricane storm surge coming over the dikes. I'm just seeing as your, uh, thank you for the, uh, 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 for identifying those issues. And I think, you know, it's funny, like, 
thinking about this stuff can be pretty depressing. <laughs> but I, I actually think, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, really innovative stuff that goes on, and also just like, in my opinion, but I think it's, it's actually, uh, and this is part of this idea of these kind of conflicting uh, tensions, uh, uh, you do get to see these, you know, kind of really uh, pretty incredible uh, uh, moments of, you know, kind of spontaneous organization, social cooperation, um, and I don't know, I'm not an internal optimist, but to some extent that kind of gives me it's an interesting topic. So maybe you can wrap up. Just kind of related to that, I was wondering, um, on a municipal level, thinking of the Richmond example, so they're just sitting at, you know, that, that's just like a huge liability just popping up all over this. Um, at a municipal level, can they, or do they, or are they required to um, carry any kind of insurance, or can they insure against that where they know it's sort of a no? Yeah, um, I actually, I, I, I started to try and dig into exactly how that works uh, from a public angle, and I, I don't actually know very much about it. My understanding is that a lot of, uh, uh, at least the, the, on the public side, is uninsured, and so they just kind of deal with that um, after, the, after the fact. Uh, but there is actually some um, uh, kind of interesting proposals that are uh, the booking requiring uh, municipalities or localities to effectively insure areas. So not even really buildings, but ensure kind of whole areas as a way to um, uh, 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 so get them in the door of, of trying to take advantage of some of these risk management strategies. And so um, I don't know much about that, but I, I think that's kind of interesting. So kind of moving away from the sort of like building by building or site by site um, uh, risk management idea and into sort of more uh, area. Because as you said, you can sometimes sort of stick out uh, more sort of public interest. And they've done a tremendous amount of emergency preparedness and exercises, and you know they, they have that for a long time. Yeah. 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 The problem is actually self-insured too, which is kind of scary. They figure it's more, it's cheaper to pay a lawsuit out of the coffers instead of paying insurance. Yeah. That would come. Yeah. Self-insured. Okay, well listen, I'll, uh, I'll end it there. Thank you for all coming, and thank you for those who offered their sort of thoughts and expertise. I really appreciate hearing that. Um, folks who want to talk earlier or uh, further, I'm always interested in this stuff. So uh, thanks a lot. Have a safe home.